In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of perception by learning more about the structure of the human visual system, that is, by learning about how we see. Now, psychologists know all about and have studied extensively all kinds of senses, all of our senses, but I would say that vision is far and away the system, the sensory modality that we know the most about, and so that's what I'm going to focus on in this video. So here's a bird's eye view of how uh, sort of vision works, starting with the anatomy of the eye, and that's going to be the focus of the majority of this video. Structures in the front of our eyes, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, influence how much light enters the eye, and they focus incoming light to form an upside-down image in the back of the eye. So whatever you're looking at, the whole world that you're seeing is actually upside down when it hits your eye. And this is really interesting because it just shows the power of the brain, and it shows that Similar to how memory is reconstructive, not reproductive, well, vision is also reconstructive. You don't walk around seeing the whole world upside down. No, you see the world right side up, and that's because your brain is reconstructing your image, reconstructing your experience in a way that's consistent with the reality of the world, but it's not what actually hits your eye. So there's a lot of processing that's done in areas of the brain, like the occipital lobe, especially as we discussed before, that really make it so that you can perceive, you can experience the world in a meaningful and accurate way. But let's start with some basic anatomy. First you have the sclera. This is simply the white part of the eye. Next you have the iris, and this is the colored part of the eye. If you, for example, have brown eyes or blue eyes or whatever, it's your iris that gives you that color. Next we have the pupil. The pupil is a circular hole through which light enters the eye. The pupil can constrict or dilate, it can sort of expand or contract, and this is a useful skill that happens pretty much automatically, because think about it, when you're in a dark environment, it's nighttime or you're in a dark room, let's say, you don't want to constrict your pupil, you want to uh, sort of dilate it, expand it as much as possible so that you can allow as much light in as possible because there's not a lot of light to begin with. So when you walk outside though and it's a really bright shiny day or whatever, you want to constrict your pupil because you don't want to allow a ton of light in because it's already so bright that might hurt your eye, it would at the very least be uncomfortable, and so your pupil constricts to only allow a little bit of light in because there's already so much going around. That's again all thanks to your pupil. Next we have the lens. The lens is a structure that bends light to fine-tune an image, one of two main structures that have this functionality. Now we have control over the curvature of our lens, and this control is called accommodation. You've done this before. If you've tried to squint, right, to see something very far away, or you have something very close to your face and you open your eyes really wide, what you're doing there is you're specifically trying to change the curvature of your lens to fine-tune the image appropriately based on the distance away from your face it is. That's accommodation. Next we have the cornea, which is kind of similar. Again, it's the second that serves this role of bending light to focus images on the retina, which I'll tell you about next. The cornea is a curved, transparent layer that covers, it's over the iris and the pupil, and as we'll talk about at the very end of this video, problems with the curvature of the cornea can lead to visual impairments. So if you're nearsighted or farsighted, it's very possible that a difference or a problem with the curvature of your cornea is at fault, but I'll get to that in just a little bit. Next we have this retina, which I've mentioned at least once already. The retina is critical. This is where all your sense receptors are. It's a thin membrane in the back of the eye. It's the entire back layer of the eye where light hits. And it contains these sense receptors, which again, I'll tell you more about rods and cones that they're called. And these rods and cones transduce light. Think back to what transduction is. It's the process of taking light or whatever physical signal from the environment, in this case light because we're talking about vision, but if you're talking about hearing, it's sound waves, whatever it is, the, the term transduction means you're taking that external signal and you're turning it into electrical activity that your brain can use, that your brain can process. So you have these sense receptors that are called rods and cones, two different kinds of them, all in the back of the retina, and they transduce light into electrical signals and they send those signals to the rest of the brain uh, for processing, majority of which is kind of taking place in the occipital lobe, but different parts of what you're seeing and experiencing are processed in different parts of your brain in general. Next we have the fovea, which is a part of the retina, but it's a really important part of the retina. The fovea is the central part of the retina. It's in the center, 
and it's whatever you're looking at. So in this video, you're probably looking at the term fovea, for example. So that word, if you're looking directly at the word on the screen, fovea, it is hitting your fovea. It's hitting the central part of your retina. Uh, so this fovea is responsible for visual acuity and color as well, but especially visual acuity. So whenever you're reading, you're looking directly at something, you're processing what you're seeing in great detail. And the reason it can do that kind of have that level of detail is because it's densely packed with cones. And as we'll see in a minute, cones are specialized for processing detail and color. But before I spoil too much, I'll give you one last term and then we'll talk about rods and cones. Finally, we have the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a structure containing axons of ganglion cells. That's less important. But importantly, uh, what is important is that this structure is what takes those signals that electrical activity at this point from, you know, the fovea, from the retina, and sort of transmits that information to the rest of the brain. All right, now let's talk about rods and cones. So we're going to zoom in on one specific part of the retina, right, that has both rods and cones. Now, rods and cones are called rods and cones because they literally look like rods and cones. So what I'm showing you here on the screen is sort of my symbolic icon interpretation of rods and cones. They look something like this, but guess which one is the rod and which ones are the cones? Obviously the one that looks like a rod is a rod and the ones with pointy ends that ha kind of have cones on their heads, so to speak, uh, those are the cones. And you can see that we have uh, red, green, and blue cones. We'll get to that in a future video. I'm not going to say anything about that right now because we're going to talk about how we process color next, but not right now. Rods are receptor cells that are in charge of night vision. Now the fovea has no rods. And again, it's densely packed with only cones, which I'll talk about next. So rods are great for night vision, meaning they only require very low levels of light in order to operate. Of course, the downside is they can't process color very well, and they're not really um, great for sort of seeing fine detail. In contrast, cones are in charge of color vision and visual acuity. So they require more light in order to operate, but they give you greater detail. And as I mentioned, the fovea is densely packed with cones. So when you walk into a dark room, your rods sort of come online and your cones go offline. This is why you have that 30 second period of you know, adjusting to a dark room if you turn the lights off or something and it's nighttime. For the first 10 or 20 seconds, you can't see at all. And that's because your cones are online and they require too much light. So in this dark environment, they don't work at all. And then it takes a little bit of time to adjust and your rods start to come online. And that's when you can start to see things in the dark environment a few seconds later. Uh, another interesting point about rods, remember there's no rods in your fovea. So if you're in a really dark environment where you're trying to look at something dim, you're trying to see something dim, it's actually worse for you to look directly at that thing. It's better to look a little bit off to the side. Think about why that is. If you look directly at like a star, okay, it's a really dark night, there's a dim star you want to see um, or whatever. If you look directly at it, that star is going to hit your fovea. Well, your fovea only has cones. It doesn't have any rods, and that will not produce enough light for you to actually see the star. So if you're stargazing, it's actually better to look an inch or two off to the right or to the left so that you're staring at the star with your peripheral vision and your eyes are actually going somewhere else. And this is because the star will then, the light produced from the star, I should say, will then hit your rods. It won't hit your fovea where there are no rods. It'll hit your rods and you can actually see it. As a last topic, I want to go back to that issue of farsightedness and nearsightedness, visual impairments. So myopia is what we call nearsightedness. And what causes this is that we have light focused in front of the retina instead of directly on the retina, which means when the light finally gets to the retina, it's not going to be the right size. It's going to be a blurred. It's going to be distorted. It's not focused in the right location. Now this has two main causes, and I mentioned the cornea a while back, which its job is sort of to bend the light. Now this is caused by your cornea being too steep, or for some people, maybe your cornea is per uh, perfectly fine, but your eye is too long, and so the retina is further back than where it should be, resulting in, again, the light being focused in front of the retina. Hyperopia is similar, but it works the opposite way. This is farsightedness, in which light is focused behind the retina instead of on it, and it's caused by the cornea being too flat or the eye being too short.